All right. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, let's get started. There are all sorts of new features on the platform this time. And uh, if I can figure out how to dismiss it, uh, I hope. Uh, did you were you able to hear the music? No. No. Oh, you, you didn't. Okay. <laughs> were you singing? No, I'm not trying to sing. Uh, okay. uh, here we go. Uh, this is. Bedtime here, Gurvinder, so you could be to sleep. Uh, <laughs> well, I've got to tell the uh, run the platform guys uh, on the new music future they introduced. It's no easy way to dismiss the darn window. There's a bug in the platform. Uh, bear with me, guys. You know, this is like when you regret you did this. Just one second. This is quite crazy. Okay, I'm just going to proceed with the way it is. Um, can um, Anuradha, can you hear me? Okay, can you see me? Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, uh, sorry about that interruption as we were experimenting or I was experimenting with some new features that the platform organizers had uh, pushed out in an email. Um, but I'm so happy to be here with a preeminent uh, set of experts uh, covering pretty much uh, the entire uh, world except from the continent of Africa and uh, continent of Europe. Uh, but we have we have four experts over here with us. Anuradha Agarwal, uh, Anuradha Agarwal is the founder of Think North Consulting based in India, in the Delhi area. And she's an award-winning marketing communications and technology professional, India's most admirable Forbes India 2021 award. Uh, been the finalist for the Young Lions 2019 and 2018 marketing uh, my God, a very, very long list of credentials that I can't even do justice to over here. Um, and her company, Think North Consulting, works as marketing strategists and brand consultants to some of the most admirable, impact-driven companies and organizations. Uh, Anuradha, would you like to say a few words uh, before I introduce the others? Right. Uh, thank you, Gurvinder, for having me on this panel. It's an absolute honor uh, to be with all of you. And, uh, you know, like Gurvinder mentioned, and I would just like to add two points to that. I think one of the uh, main aims remains uh, to be technology first marketing communications company. And that is why I have, you know, repeatedly invested into, uh, you know, AI going forward when it comes to marketing. Uh, another area that remains very close to my heart is having more women in leadership positions. So I, uh, you know, remain mentoring, you know, I continue to mentor young girls so that more women in India uh, you know, can be in leadership position. So that's about me. We have limited time. So, you know, let's go to other panelists now, Garvinda. So kind of you. Our second panelist is Mikhail Mosca. Mikhail is based out of Canada. He's the co-founder and president of Evolution Q. Now, you're going to be really impressed with his background. Dr. Mosca is one of the world's leading scientists in quantum computing, quantum cryptography, and conventional cryptography in an era with quantum technologies. He was a founder of Canada's Institute for Quantum Computing, was a founding faculty member of Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, and Mikhail co-authored the respected textbook, An Introduction to Quantum Computing, which, Mikhail, I should a copy and then get you to sign it. Absolutely. Um, so, Mikhail, thank you so much for joining. Would you like to add anything to your background or uh, say a few words? Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. I mean, the essence of my work is to is, is two prongs. One is to allow the world to benefit from all the positive applications of quantum computing, but to do so in a way that is safe, that is secure. So to prepare, proactively prepare for the negative side effects, and in doing so, create a you know, security infrastructure that is more resilient than 
is not only resilient to quantum technology, but is more resilient to other unknown uh, vulnerabilities of the future. Thank you, Mikhail, and uh, welcome to the panel. Welcome, Anuradha. Our third panelist is uh, Girish Ramachandran. Girish is based out of Singapore. He is the president of Asia Pack of TCS and a board member of the Global Reporting Institute. Girish is responsible for TCS's business growth in the region. He has led the business on a almost 12% year-on-year revenue growth to become Asia's Asia Pack's leading IT consultancy firm employing almost 35,000 staff across 12 markets. Grish is a strong proponent of the Business 4.0 philosophy and committed to harnessing the power of technology and innovation to drive sustainable business outcomes, something very pertinent to the discussion that I'll give an overview of in just a few minutes. Welcome, Grish. Would you like to add anything else or share a few remarks? Um, first of all, greetings to all of you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it is, uh, this is my 26th year in uh, TCS, and um, I've, li I've lived and worked across uh, multiple continents. Um, but what I see in, um, happening, um, I, I see three important tenets for um, organizations to succeed in this uh, post-COVID era. Uh, the three things which I see is um, digitization, innovation, and sustainability. And I strongly believe that all the three have to coexist so that we have a better future. So I'll speak a little bit of, little bit of this uh, when, when, as we go along. Thank you. Thank you, Girish, for bringing in the expertise and keeping us honest and uh, focused on the sustainability topic. Welcome again. Um, our last but not the least panelist is William Ting. William is the new, actually the new strategy, uh, the VP of strategy at uh, a company called HighRitual.com. He's based in the U.S. and he's also the former legal advisor to TSMC, which is the largest semiconducting semiconductor fab, Taiwan Semiconductors. Um, William is an award-winning attorney, admitted in California, focused on the intersection of complex technology transactions, data privacy, IP protection, and U.S. export controls. He guides commercialization of emerging technologies with a passion for data monetization. William, anything you'd like to add or any opening remarks you'd like to share? Thank you, uh, fellow panelists, uh, moderator, and Horace is very humbled and honored to be working with a very distinguished group of uh, thinkers. Our biggest human uh, uh, contribution to this world are, is, is the jobs that we're able to cre create, meaningful jobs, jobs that are able to lift people out of poverty, jobs that are able to provide people groups from underrepresented social society layers to help them break the chain of poverty. Inclusion, diversity is something that I've always believed in. And, and one of the things that attracted me to Hire Tool, the company, we're using AI-driven, data-driven technology to match job candidates from around the world to employers that are looking for engineers from diverse backgrounds, that are looking for data scientists from diverse backgrounds, that are looking for talent in the sustainability industries for people with coming from diverse backgrounds, just like Horasis. The vision of an all-inclusive, culturally equal group of human, human individuals. And that is the vision that we also want to achieve. Thank you. Welcome, William. Thanks for those remarks. And uh, my name is Gurvinder Alawalia. By now, you might have figured I'm the moderator of the panel. And this is the panel on technology facilitating access to international markets. My background is deeply and extensively in technology. Most recently, I spearhead um, uh, platform development strategy and platform implementation using blockchain, uh, but also at the intersection of IoT, cloud, and increasingly AI and machine learning. Um, even though I come from a very long heritage of corporate and enterprise uh, background and systems, I was previously the CTO of IBM's blockchain, IoT, and cloud business covering North America. I'm now more in a technology neutral, product neutral position and as an entrepreneur for my company called Digital Twin Labs, uh, based out of Dallas. Uh, I'm so privileged to host the group over here. Um, let's get into the core of the discussion. 
So when we talk about technology facilitating access to international markets, uh, one of the questions, and rather I might just keep it in, in the same order of the introduction, I'll probably start with you a little bit, um, and then we can sample around a few other questions uh, with the others. Um, can you help us understand or level set the group over here as well as the audience? What do, we, what do you mean and what are you seeing when we talk about access, the word access and to international markets? Uh, what's the ad tech and the branding perspective from, from your end on that? All right. Uh, thank you for asking me that, Gurvinder. And uh, so I'll just bring it, uh, you know, uh, bring a little marketing lens to the, you know, the whole topic. And, you know, I see uh, AI and blockchain as yin and yang, right? Uh, so artificial intelligence, you can, you can, you know, it's prescriptive, right? You can forecast. And uh, what it is important to notice is, you know, when you are, uh, so there's human intelligence and artificial intelligence and blockchain. And I see that as, you know, uh, holy trinity, right? Where to use what in a marketing uh, system, it's very important, right? Human intelligence is very important from an idea perspective, you know, from a sentiment perspective, right? Technologies like AI, they can be, you know, uh, majorly used to automate, to automate and disseminate information. You know, there's one campaign by Mondelez International. And um, uh, why do I talk about this campaign is because I think India is huge, not only in terms of area and population, but also in terms of the languages and the cultures. And if you can have one campaign which is running Pan India, because they have used an AI, it also basically uh, you know shows the potential how the marketing campaigns going forward can be automated, can be uh, you know hyper segmented, hyper localized using the tools. So what Cadbury uh, you know did and. Uh, this that campaign can, is scalable, uh, you know, across the regions. It's something that could also be, you know, uh, could be copied in a region like Singapore. So, uh, uh, what this what the campaign did? They were showing the uh, they were showing the local shops based on the pin code, right? So there was a human intelligence which you know got the insights of you know personalizing the ad and you know using the whole atmosphere around an Indian festival called Diwali. AI was used to be able to deliver that ad. And I think, you know, uh, when it comes to technologies like this, I think it is very important that, you know, even sitting from India right now, I'm catering to some of the international brands, right? And I can do sentiment analysis on my system, right? So that's what has technology enabled. You get access to, you know, some of the data points and some of the accounts, and you're able to run some codes and, you know, figure out okay, what is the sentiment analysis of the brand. So I feel, uh, you know, you know, AI plays a major role and that is, you know, uh, something to look at. Uh, another important point that I want to, uh, you know, talk about the use of blockchain in digital marketing. Uh, I think, uh, you know, right now, uh, you know, you know, when we sign up on the app, we don't really know how much data are we giving, right? So most of the times we just click OK, sure. And, you know, the apps are, you know, accessing our contact list or, you know, gallery pictures. And I think blockchain as a marketing to, uh, you know, uh, you know, if these things are done on a blockchain, I think it is, you know, you're, you're right now what as marketers we are doing, we are, you know, targeting and rather, but also targeting her on Facebook, Google ads everywhere. I'm spending as a brand, I'm spending 4x the money because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to tap into her into, you know, from four different mediums. So I think, you know, when, so, uh, you know, when a technology like blockchain is used just to put in very, uh, you know, normally as a layman language, it's like removing the middleman, right? So when you're able to do that, I think you get, uh, you know, better ROI on the money spent, uh, you know, as a brand, as we have also seen, uh, you know, I, and I think, you know, the other day when I was having a discussion with William, and I think he also brought up this point that, you know, the increasing, uh, you know, number, the, the cases of ad frauds, right, across, across globe, right? So right now, if I think around $350 billion is the digital advertising industry, and almost 10% of that accounts for ad fraud. And if that is minimized using blockchain, I think, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, you know, brands could do better using the same amount of money. So I think these are, you know, some of the important points uh, that, uh, you know, I feel, uh, you know, technology can really enable and uh, make this world more accessible. Excellent. Well, thank you, Anuradha. I liked uh, the articulation of human intelligence, artificial intelligence and blockchain. And sometimes I feel um it kind of challenged uh, human intelligence to be at the same pedestal with artificial intelligence and blockchain but i i see the the the, the triumvir triumvirate that you're trying to draw over here which brings me to um kind of raise the discussion into 
into a natural tension that exists in the industry that here we are where we are looking to all these platforms. Um, I'm beginning to, you know, pull in and point towards, uh, uh, towards Mikhail in just a moment. Uh, we are, you know, we are standing up these massive platforms and not only are the technologists, but even the branding, the marketing, non-technology people are coming to uh, rely um, on these underlying engines and platforms. And we know uh, today in the U.S. Um, uh, the outage of uh, the Fastly content uh, uh, distribution network, you know, took down several several sites. Uh, uh, well. Uh, worldwide, but uh, uh, the, the the outage uh, uh, of the underlying provider was uh, from the U.S. Uh, anyway, my point being, uh, while we are building these platforms, what is the threat, right? Uh, and I don't necessarily mean just traditional cybersecurity threat, but with the uh, with the with the dawn of quantum computing, might I add, uh, Mikhail, you are the best person perhaps in the world, not just in this panel one of the best people in the world um, to kind of weigh in on that. We are very privileged. So can you can you resolve for us where this tension is headed between the threat from quantum computing and the systems and reliability that we are trying to build? Yeah, well, I mean, throughout human history, uh, whenever we get a new capability, we're excited to, to seize all the short-term uh, rewards. Uh, and the longer term, you know, the risks, you know, the immediate risks, we deal with them. Uh, those are internalized. But the longer-term risks and consequences, especially if they're a bit nebulous and spread out and not attributable to us necessarily, those tend to uh, be ignored for a while until you can't anymore. Uh, so then they eventually become a crisis, and then, then that, that, that cost is internalized, and then we do something about it. But as, as you know, as things get increasingly uh, digitized and, and our systems become more and more global, instantaneous, systemic, <clears throat> the threats become more systemic, instantaneous, and global, right? Like we know what happens, you know, when a, you know, if one meat processing plant gets taken down for a day or two, <clears throat> it has implications. And if a few days earlier a water processing plant gets poisoned because of a cyber attack and so on, <clears throat> It's not pleasant, but, you know, it's, we kind of know how to manage with these. It's increasing in frequency. It's increasing in impact, but it's still kind of a manageable thing. But it's clear where it's heading, right? More systemic, more impactful, and more and harder to remediate threats. And we're still instinctively saying, okay, but do I need to deal with it? Uh, how, do I, how, uh, what, how can I benefit today? And we'll try as much as possible to put a push off the threat in the future. So the quantum threat is one example, which kind of takes us, jumps ahead to where we're heading in a sense. It's very exemplary of, of essentially the trend that we're facing. All of our digital platforms need to be secure using untrusted platforms. You need, you need some degree of trust. You're not going to trust every component, but there's a few anchors that you do trust. There's some physical security somewhere, but you don't physically secure the whole internet. That's not why we trust it. We trust it because, you know, we, we, we trust Microsoft or whoever, right? That the code they give us, we, we trust to download. They're, of course, they physically secure their keys and so on, but it's cryptography is, is the missing piece. And, and the more cryptography, the stronger the cryptography, the less you have to trust, the less physical security. You need. It's never zero. But you, enabling capability like quantum computing, one of its known applications is to break the public key cryptography we use today, you, you know, almost ubiquitously. I mean, broadly widespread around the world. Um, if it were broken tomorrow, and it could be, I mean, it's, you don't need a quantum computer necessarily. A smart mathematician might just say, hey, wait a minute, here's how you break the code. <clears throat> that would lead to a systemic collapse and a sustained one. It's not just, oh, that was a bad morning. It's like, that was a bad year or decade, right? Because these systems take a long time to bring back online and it's getting harder. How hard is it to secure these platforms? It's hard and getting harder because the supply chain keeps getting more complex, intertwined. Uh, it, it's just becoming, we're digging a bigger and bigger hole. So my hope is quantum gives us a bit of a, a look ahead to how bad it will be Now's our chance. It's perhaps our last chance, really, to say, look, 
robustness, resilience, sustainability. These are good buzzwords. We really have to bake these into everything we do. <clears throat> Let's build our digital platforms to be more robust and resilient, not just against quantum attacks, because there'll be others, but to attacks in general. It's not going to be perfect. Nobody's saying we're going to build unhackable networks, but let's just improve everything so we're much more uh, you know, resilient and agile and adaptable to, to emerging threats. And let's, and this is the hardest part, let's internalize the medium term and long term cost and rewards of being proactive. I think that's essential. Otherwise, uh, it's very clear that we're, we're not going in a good direction uh, if we don't start doing that better. Mikhail, thank you. Thank you so much for, um, you know, throwing, throwing light uh, from that angle, uh, being able to kind of foresee. You see some of the future, you know, sooner than uh, the, the others of us uh, over here that aren't that deep in, in quantum. Um, and as I segue over to Grish, um, what I want to kind of remark is, is as we build these new digitize, digitized platforms like what we are building and what has in some sense, most might argue, been accelerated in the pandemic, uh, and then the future, the rest of the future, you know, yet to come like that of uh, quantum computing, um, we we are building a ship and the thing about the thing about building a ship is that we also are building a shipwreck when you build the ship you also build the shipwreck so Grish, i want to turn the discussion towards you uh not from the harshness of that statement but more from the aspect of sustainability right so you are positioned particularly for, from singapore which is one of the smartest cities smartest countries in the world um and you're also positioned from your role at tcs to see a very very wide spectrum of adoption and practices um what are you seeing and what are your thoughts or call for action in the area of sustainability and how real is it this time as opposed to checking off boxes in you know corporate you know, uh, marketing narratives uh, with all apologies to Anuradha, but how real and genuine is the sustainability wave that we are experiencing this time? Thank you, Gurvinder. So let me, let me just uh, contextify what I want to say first. So as we all know, we are living through the fourth industrial revolution. And um, we have seen the velocity, the scale and scope of change has been transformational. And essentially, there has been a lot of breakthrough in new technologies, whether it's blockchain, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it is new ways of working like agile, a lot of things. But um, these are also, changes are also rapidly blurring international markets or international boundaries to make and uh, reshaping industries. And almost everybody post COVID has only accelerated the change set forth by Industry 4.0. In that context, if you look at what governments are doing and businesses are doing, businesses and governments are essentially focusing on accelerating digitization so that we can alleviate any future shocks. However, if you want to look at what governments are doing, governments are also being very nationalistic. Most governments are turning inwards and if you look at access to global markets today, most of global markets are being shut down. Again. So the only opportunity for organizations to look at accessing them, accessing multiple markets, being in, being, in, being in a small country, if you don't have a big domestic market, is looking at digitization. And I've been seeing this uh, from the lens of Asia, where every country is small. But if you want to look at adoption of digitization today across Asia, it's been phenomenal. And the reason why I believe digitization can help is because there is an access to multiple markets that can be provided in spite of being nationalistic. I'll give you one or two examples. Okay? So, for example, we did a very interesting project in uh, in India. You know, we India exports a lot of shrimps. And the export of shrimps goes to essentially uh, countries like EU, uh, the, the bloc, or Japan. Okay? These are the two, two major markets for that. And it was 
and EU and Japan has to go and look at tracking and tracing. And they have to see where is the um, where, where does where do the shims come from? Which pond does it come from? Is it comes from sustainable sources? Okay. Now, if you look at how do how do how do how does digitization tackle this? So we built a very interesting blockchain solution by which a person is able to we can when you go and buy a shrimp in these markets, you can essentially go down to even looking at where did the, which shrimp farm did it come from, which part of Kerala did it come from. That's a very interesting model. Okay, again, we have used technology to solve the whole issue of being sustainable, but also access to multiple markets. And this is what is going to happen in the future. So I, I want to talk about another simple thing. For example, what is happening in you, you, you know about it very well, is the whole concept about digital twin. How do you collect the information about a particular factory? And how do you use a factory to remodel it in a, in a simple iPad so that I can change parameters in the, in the on the input parameters so that I can see what my output is going to look like. We can pretty much do for the human body as well. Okay. Now, this is a simple way by which you no, know, I can change the inputs of input parameters of a, of a large factory. And we have done this for a Japanese customer. By using this, we have been able to reduce the knock emissions of the customer by almost 50%. So, I strongly believe there is an opportunity for us to exist, coexist with the rising nationalism, but accessing multiple markets using um, using digitization, whether it is tools like blockchain, whether it is tools like digital twin or any of that, and having um, sustainability at the core of this particular transformation. Girish, um, thank you so much, and particularly with some very, very well-grounded examples, I might uh, get, a, get a chance to come back um, and, and we can go a little bit deeper, particularly uh, on the aspect of international access versus uh, the nationalistic themes that you touched upon. Um, before we do that, I have a slight interruption, um, guys, and um, <coughs> that's partly because I cannot mute myself. Uh, and when we end the stream, I, uh, it might be a little bit choppy. And also for those in the audience, I'm not able to type into the gallery, into the chat box, because um, there's a pop-up window from this music thingy that the platform in in introduced that I'm not able to dismiss. Um, so it's a good thing that we can see and talk, e talk with each other, but I just want you to be aware of what I'm faced with over here. Uh, so when we when we when we finish up, we'll just drop off on a cliff over here. And for anybody in the audience, you know, just I can I can read your questions, but I I'm not able to control the you know handing over the mic function. So sorry about that administrative uh, kind of editorial interruption over here. I had to do it at some point or the other, and I just waited for it till the end of this round of discussion. So let's take our second turn of questions and discussions over here. Um, Anuradha, let me come back to you. Um, and I, I want to look at, um, it, it, let, me, let me turn the question to you, but then I want to invite the same, the thinking on the same question to a few others. And I want to discuss, as we are discussing access to international um, markets, I want to discuss what I refer to as asymmetric economy or, you know, asymmetries in economy. Um, this is a little bit towards the struggle with inequality in the world um, from multiple dimensions. Inequality is not just about you know poverty. Inequality is on multiple multiple dimensions, and access, I might add, um, or lack thereof, is another aspect of inequality. Um, you know, sometimes it's said that it's expensive to be poor and it's cheap to be rich. Now, that, of course, has a wealth kind of an implication. But as I pointed out, my interpretation of, you know, asymmetry and inequality is wider than um, wider than just having to do with wealth. Um, so when we are dealing with with asymmetry and we are trying to provide access and inclusion, um, how do we handle inclusion that does not make sense? in an asymmetric kind of an economy, right? So 
if we already have an asymmetric economy, right? Here's the net of my my question. If we already have an asymmetric economy, then uh, is the digitization layer just kind of adding to that asymmetry, or is it is it providing a counterweight to that asymmetry? Um, so if not from the, certainly not from the technology perspective, and I'll call upon some of the others to weigh in on the technology perspective of that, but on rather, can you throw some light from the social contracts, social relationships and branding perspectives um, on this topic? So, uh, Gurvinder, I think uh, the asymmetry that you're referring to, I feel, uh, you know, right now when the apps have a data, Sometimes as a marketer, I am targeting the same person two years later, right? And uh, the data is outdated for me, to be very honest. Like, you know, what I was in 2019, it's very different from what I am 2021. As a normal human being, everybody evolves, their choices evolve, even from a consumer perspective. So when I talk about introducing all these digital mediums on a technology called blockchain, I'm also referring that the consumers have access to how much data should be there, how much they want to share, and like whenever they, for how long it's going to be there. So it's not only about how much, but it's also about how long. So that also gives the control to the consumer, which can bring in some sort of symmetry, according to me. And uh, uh, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, that is, uh, you know, a very important, like, you know, what is important to say is that as brand and marketers or as companies, we got to be part of consumers journey rather than rather than we trying to put them to be part of our journey. So I think, you know, with the use of technologies like blockchain, especially in the context of digital marketing, which is my, uh, you know, the area of expertise, I feel that could be leveled out. Thank you. And rather, um, William, let me direct the question, sure. let me redirect the same question. That's a great you, question. Particularly because you come from, yes. you know, the social science, science yes. and sociology kind of legal background. Can you throw some light on that and, um, and then yeah. we'll see where to go? That is a key question that regulators, politicians, leaders, entrepreneurs are thinking. We all have heard all the stories about big tech using techno technology to create those very asymmetric balances that you mentioned. Right. But I, I'm a big personal believer of using technology to to reinforce a more equal balance of power. Why? Because, for example, AI, Dr. Mosca is also in this line of work as well. Um, AI is a tool that's able to help the Davids in this world of Goliaths. We're able to help the Davids using a tool that can help the David do what he or she wants to do. If he or she wants to find a better job, okay, use an AI tool that's able to place their CVs in front of a, 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 a up and coming or sustainability driven company or a market ad tech driven company. Uh, artificial intelligence can be used. Yes, can be used to reinforce asymmetrical balances. Yes, that's, there are many antitrust investigations being launched against certain companies by European regulators, by the United States government on this very question. But I, but yes, there are examples out in the market that shows that technology can be used to create a f more fair balance of power. For example, using AI, candidates are able to use AI search searches to be able to get their resumes out. Small recruiters, rec you know, the, the business of recruiting used to be very personable, socializable. After the introduction of certain technology, it became very informal, mechanized, automated. Now with new tools that are coming out in the market, recruiters are having a new tool that is able to re-socialize the business of HR. So that's one example of an application of a technology that shows that yes, technology can address the informational or the asymmetric uh, imbalance. That's a very good question, uh, Yuri. Um, Thank you. Thank you, William. And let me take the discussion to um, Mikhail before we turn uh, back to Girish um, on a different question for Girish later. Um, uh, Mikhail, particularly since your, uh, your credentials and your name was just invoked, what, what do you see as the role of frontier technologies like quantum computing in the context of um, 
access to international markets? Uh, right. So, I mean, and again, tying it in with your initial question of, is it going to make things more asymmetric, more fair or less fair? Uh, at the technology level, it's a design choice. Like, there's no fundamental reason why uh, quantum computing capabilities should make the world more fair or less fair. It can make uh, for a more prosperous and just world, as can AI, as can blockchain. It's ultimately a design choice. It's a choice of what, you know, are the, are those with power going to continue to, you know, rake things in a sense to continue to concentrate power or not? We know in the long run, if you do that too much, things will blow up and we're all worse off. But, you know, look at human history for thousands of years. And I hope we can... I hope with this greater dissemination of knowledge, we get better at uh, not hurting our collective long-term prospects. And we do sort of sincerely engineer uh, more equitable and fair access. So for example, quantum computers, the initial ones are gonna be very expensive and hard to maintain and run. So does that mean only a small group of individuals will have access or will we allow you know, online cloud access to these platforms and really democratize access to these platforms. And those of us working in the field are largely pushing for the latter window where everyone has fair access uh, to the wonderful transformative uh, capabilities of quantum computing. The tools are there. Uh, mostly, again, most people working in the field, that's, that's the vision they're working for. So really it's a decision as a society, a global society to actually implement uh, that vision. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mikhail. Um, I'm just going to switch gears, uh, but I want to set up some context before I point my next question to Girish, um, which is a little bit to Girish, what you were raising earlier around kind of the nationalistic movements. And then I want to bring up kind of the tension with technology. But the context before that I want to set so you can relate to where I'm coming from is um, in my previous role, as the CTO for North America, uh, IBM and cloud blockchain and IoT, um, I was very early in the cloud movement. And one of the problems that I ran into, that we ran into, every cloud provider ran into, is cloud being you know anywhere, everywhere, available, accessible, ubiquitous access. Um, then you have to now clamp it down with, um, with uh, data movements across borders. Right. So, uh, for example, you can't move, you know, personal information out of Europe. Uh, in fact, you can't move seismic data out of certain countries, you know, so on and so forth. Now, those are some pretty well-established laws, but nationalistic movements, which is a pretty common theme that we've seen in many countries. And I have some numbers over here, which actually might be pertinent on where the state of the, where the, a, a quick state of the world is. And I'd like you to weigh in, weigh in, in in the role of kind of new frontier technologies, in 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 light of in light of this situation. So here's some data: fifty three percent of the world, which is about four billion people, live under authoritarian rule. Um, and when I first heard that number, it my my it just blew my mind off. So that's more than half the world is living under authoritarian rule. And there are 1.2 billion people currently living in countries experiencing double or triple digit inflation. Okay. I think most of us on this panel and perhaps in the audience are privileged enough to be in countries where inflation is single digit or maybe, you know, low double digits. But we are talking about double and triple digit inflation in countries like Iran, Nigeria, Venezuela. You know, you've seen all of it. So my question, Grish, is... When you, when you were alluding to some of the um, sustainability efforts, broadly speaking, environmental sustainability and governance, but adjacent to that are fiscal and you know, political kind of regulatory policies, what, what role does, does frontier kind of technologies that we are looking at, what role do they have, play, do they have to play in you know, bettering some of this data and statistics that I happen to block. Thank you. So if I take, a, again, a step back, if you look at what is driving the whole sustainability agenda, it's essentially two things. One is consumers. 
uh, consumers are pushing more and more. If you look at most of the consumers in the world are Gen Y or Gen Z, and they are the ones who are today forty five percent of the world is made out of them, and they are the ones who are deciding whether to join a company or not, or essentially whether they want to buy a product or a service from a company. And if you look at that, they are a big stakeholder in the whole overall the consumer group. The second one is essentially investors. Investors are pushing on companies to start adopting a much more purpose-led organization. So if you look at context of this, and then you know, I just want to throw up a topic which is going to come up very soon is this whole thing about COVID vaccines. Now, if you look at nationalistic uh, sentiments and you go across borders. You will find that you know every border has a has a different type of vaccine being being given, and today the problem is compounded by the fact that, for example, if I have in Singapore, I get my Pfizer vaccine, I cannot use my Pfizer vaccine if I have to go to China because that's not valid. In, it's not valid there. Okay, so essentially every country is putting a condition that you need to have a particular type of vaccine, okay? and this is the nationalistic fervor which is going around the world. So I did a very interesting thing about trying to see whether I could give access to actually consumers to decide what is the data that they need to open up. I think that is going to be the future, uh, Gurvinder. I feel that we need consumers to be given the choice of what they should be, what they should reveal, what they should not reveal, so that uh, we can we can actually level the whole nationalistic favor which is happening around. Grish, I'll make you feel better. I I just uh, came back from Hawaii as we were talking before the before the meeting started, and you know just to remind the audience, Hawaii is a state of the United States, and I live in Texas. They did not accept my CDC vaccination card yeah, there you go. within within the state. So this is these are the rules within 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 the state. Um, so I can totally relate to the points that you are making. Uh, well, team, we have a couple of minutes, and let's spend those last two minutes in just doing a quick 30-second round the table. We'll go in the order we were introduced. And um, if there is some sound bite you want to leave which serves your purpose, the purpose of the company that you represent, uh, or you know serves a certain call for action, uh, this is the moment to do it, and we'll wrap up with that. So, Anuradha, would you like to go first? Sure, sure. So, uh, I'd just like to wrap up saying that we got to understand where the technology needs to be used, which section of the pyramid that, you know, we need to engage in and with what technology. Like, uh, with AI, you can't be at the top of the pyramid. It has to be at the bottom of the pyramid, right? Especially when it comes to marketing. And I think the complete and, you know, no matter what technology are you using, the human intelligence is going to be integral part of it. And having said that, uh, I think sustainability has to be at the core, whether it whether it is in terms of, you know, the technology or human resources or anything else. Thank you, Anuradha. Um, and again, thank you for joining uh, the effort and the time you put into into the panel over here. Um, Mikhail, would you like to go next with um, with uh, any message uh, that serves you, uh, your efforts? Yeah, I mean, uh, thriving and not just surviving in the era of new, very, very disruptive technologies it is really heavily depends on getting ready. Right? We're not talking about something that might have a 10% impact. We're talking about something that's with an astronomical impact. Uh, you have to, while you're doing all the dealing with all the day to day, uh, you know, drinking fire from a, wa a water hose and dealing with the short here and now, organizations and countries that can spend a little bit of resources on their readiness planning um, will benefit a lot in the long run. And that's what my companies are all about uh, preparing for the quantum era in various ways. Uh, so I urge you to spend a little, you know, some fraction of resources. Because you, otherwise, at some point, you're going to be in sort of a panic. Uh, you're going to be on the other side of the, of the, of the uh, what, what does uh, Jeffrey Moore call it? The chasm. Uh, and then it'll be really too late. Crossing the chasm, to, uh, yes. You'll be in a panic, and then uh, there'll be all sorts of consequences uh, for these, uh, if you're not ready for these very disruptive uh, technologies. 
Excellent. Um, I'll give it really quick, uh, Girish, and then finish up with William. Uh, our stream is uh, ending or has ended, but the recording will continue. So I'll give it up to uh, Girish for a real quick close up. Yeah, I will. So I believe we are in the fourth industrial revolution, and uh, it's not, I strongly believe it's not about technology or business, but it's about society. And we have to accept the fact that whatever we do has to actually help the society at large. Thank you. Thank you. And William, uh, for you to wrap up. Uh, really quick, uh, we're very excited to use one of humankind's most powerful tool that we have ever invented, AI, and combining that to humanize our most valuable asset, human capital, in a resilient manner, crypto post-quantum uh, post cryptically safe manner. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. And, you know, my passion and my purpose in this stage of my life and career is always to bring change uh, with new technologies for the social good and the social causes that all of you are alluding to. Thank you so much. You. And sure. I'm going to shut the browser and that'll probably end everything. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.